ಶ್ರೀಶೈಲೇಶದಯಾಪಾತ್ರಂ ಧೀಭಕ್ತಿಯಾದಿ ಗುಣಾರ್ಣವಂ ಯತೀಂದ್ರ ಪ್ರವಣಂ ವಂದೇ ರಮ್ಯ ಜಾತರ ಮುನಿಂ ಲಕ್ಷ್ಮೀನಾಥ ಸಂಭಾಂ ನಾಥಯಾಮುನ ಮಧ್ಯಮಾಂ ಅಸ್ಮದಾಚಾರ್ಯ ಪರ್ಯಂತ ವಂದೇ ಗುರುಪರಂಪರಾ ಯೋ ನಿತ್ಯಂ ಅಚ್ಯುತ ಪದಾಂಬುಜಯುಗ್ಮರುಗ್ಮ ವ್ಯಾಮೋಹತಸ್ತಿತರಾಣಿ ತೃಣಾಯಮೇನೆ ಅಸ್ಮದ್ಗುರೋರ್ ಭಗವತೋಸ್ಯ ದೈಕ ಸಿಂಧೋ ರಾಮಾನುಜ ಚರಣೌ ಶರಣ ಪ್ರಪದ್ಯೇ ಲೋಕಾಚಾರ್ಯಾ ಗುರವೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣಪಾದ ಸೂನವೇ ಸಂಸಾರ ಭೋಗಿ ಸಂದಷ್ಟ ಜೀವ ಜೀವಾತವೇ ನಮಃ ಶ್ರೀಶೈಲೇಶಭಕ್ತಿ ಗುಣಾರ್ಣವೀಂದ್ರ ಪ್ರವಣ ವಂದೇ ರಮ್ಯ ಜಾತರ ಮುನಿ ಲಕ್ಷ್ಮೀನಾಥ ಸಂಭಾಂ ನಾಥಯ ಮುನ ಮಧ್ಯಮಾಂ ಅಸ್ಮದಾಚಾರ್ಯ ಪರ್ಯಂತ ವಂದೇ ಗುರು ಪರಂಪರಾಂ ಯೋ ನಿತ್ಯಮಚ್ಯುತ ಯೋ ನಿತ್ಯಮಚ್ಯುತ ಪದಾಂಬುಜಯುಗ್ಮರುಗ್ಮ ವ್ಯಾಮೋಹತಸ್ತಿತರಾಣಿ ತೃಣಾಯ ಮೇನೆ ಅಸ್ಮದ್ಗುರೋರ್ ಭಗವತೋಸ್ಯ ದೈಕ ಸಿಂಧೋ ರಾಮಾನುಜ ಚರಣೌ ಶರಣ ಪ್ರಪದ್ಯೇ ಲೋಕಾಚಾರ್ಯ ಗುರವೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣಪಾದ ಸೂನವೇ ಸಂಸಾರ ಭೋಗಿ ಸಂದಷ್ಟ ಜೀವ ಜೀವಾತವೇ ನಮಃ ಯಾವೃತ್ತಿರ್ಮನಸಿ ಮನಸ ಜಾತ ಸಂಸ್ಮೃತಿಸ್ತೆ ಯೋ ಯೋ ಜಲ್ಪ ಸಭವತು ವಿಭೋ ನಾಮ ಸಂಕೀರ್ತನಂತೆ ಯಾಚೇಷ್ಟಾವಪುಷಿ ಭಗವನ್ ಸಾ ಭವೇದ್ ವಂದನಂತೆ ಸರ್ವಂ ಭೂಯಾದ್ವರವರ ಮುನೆ ಸಮ್ಯಗಾರಾಧನಂತೆ so today we are going to continue the introduction to the mumukshu padi of buddhaloka acharya <coughs> which we are going to study along with the commentary of pandavala mahamuni so today we are going to <coughs> briefly touch upon the exact definition of who an acharya is of course it has been mentioned earlier a few related aspects and further to that <coughs> we are going to study what is known as the avatarika or the introduction given by swami manavada mahamuni to the mukshupadi that is in the form of generally what is known as sutras or chudnikas there is there are two words that are used to denote the text <coughs> that forms the umukshu padi of pilagoka chandya it is referred to as sutras which essentially means it is it is translated as aphorism or pithy statements which carry a lot of meaning in multi dimensional aspects but are relatively short as far as their extent is concerned on the other hand some other scholars are of the opinion that they should not be called as sutras because sutra has a different connotation in sanskrit literature and shastraic literature for example the sutras of panini the sutras of said vyasa which form the basis of the vedanta shastra or as i mentioned the sutras of panini um <clears throat> so they are of the opinion that they should be referred to by a particular english uh, tabel word called churnika once again these are also in the form of short pithy statements which carry a lot of meaning so there is not too much elaboration they are very much extreme they to the point and as far as possible they are concise in nature so brevity is one of the most important aspect of these types of uh, texts so i will just uh, share the screen with you so that you can see the uh, slides that have been prepared for this purpose 
So here, a word called achara is used. So what is the meaning of the word achara? It's very interesting. We will see that and then directly proceed to the <clears throat> proceed to the introduction given by Swami Manavada Mahamudra. So, Panchendriyasya Dehasya Buddheshya Manasastatha Dravya Desha Kriyanamcha Shuddhihi Achara Ishyate. So, in the earlier slide we saw that an Acharya is a person who helps the disciple establish himself and practice the precepts of the Shastra, which is known as Achara. And the preceptor himself practices what he preaches. And he also helps in the cleansing of the disciple internally and externally, which is actually known as Achara. And what is the definition of Achara that is given in this context? So it is Panchendriyasya Dehasya. So purity of the five sense organs, purity of the body, mind and intellect and purity of the objects used and purity of the location, purity of actions. So in fact, this is a very vast subject, a big book can be written about this shloka alone, the explanation of this shloka alone in the sense. Uh, So what, what does one mean by the purity of the sense organs? So when is the, when are the sense organs pure? So it is very important to note that, for example, if the eye has to be pure, it has to consume only those things that are beneficial for this Atman, for the spiritual progress of the Atman. Similarly, the body which is uh, the tactile sense organ as it is known or the organ that recognizes the sense of touch if that has to be pure only that those things have to be touched that help in the spiritual evolution of the atman and those things should not be touched that are unclean in the sense they are an impediment to the spiritual progress of the Atma. So this is very important. So all the five sense organs, namely the ear, which consumes good um, sounds. So for example, it should, one should avoid listening to bad things, listening to people say something about others, probably gossips, or people when other uh, fellow Sri Vaishnavas are actually um, censure, censuring of God, censuring of the Sri Vaishnava literature and such other things which are detrimental to the progress of the art. So that is the pure, that is how the purity of the ear is, the sense organ called the ear is maintained. Similarly, purity of the eye, purity of the tongue, which is the sense organ that actually cognizes taste. So it should actually consume, uh, used, it, it should be used to consume only those that are conducive, conducive to the meditation of the Supreme Lord Narayana. That is consumed, conducive to perform japa, dhyana, etc. So it should not be used to consume onion, garlic, and other rajasaharas, tamasaharas, which are specifically mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita, like Katvam la lavana atyushta, tikshna ruksha vidahinaha, aharaha, rajasasya ishtaha, dukkha shoka, amaya pradaha. So these foods should not be consumed in the sense. Why do we consume these foods? Because we are used, we are <coughs> given to consume rajasic foods. So people, most of the people, 99.9% .9 of the people consume Rajasik and Tamasik foods only. Rajasik foods, Sattvic foods are only part of their 
diet or their daily food so in india for example 99% of the people today consume onion and garlic and as we all know more than 70% or 75% of the population in the entire world is non vegetarian so do they eat food just to fill their stomach to sustain life in the stomach in this body no they eat food as an enjoyment that to for some very small period of time when the taste lingers in the tongue so this should not be done so that is the purity of the tongue so this is the purity of the ear purity of the sense of touch that is the tactile sense organ of the skin and purity of the eyes where only good things are <clears throat> seen so one inflicting pain on another animal or another human being should not be seen things that are not conducive to spiritual progress should not be seen so that is how purity of the sense organ is achieved so similarly even the sense of fragrance so the sense which we call the olfactory sense organ which exists in the nose so one should actually have the good smell of sattvic flowers things like tulasi where tulashekara advarses jigra grana mukunda pada tulasi so then only the sense organ will be pure so this is how the purity of the sense organs or aachara with regard to sense organs is maintained similarly purity of the motor organs that also has to be included because he says panchendriya sirya so five sense organs and five motor organs that is vak pani pada payu upastha these are the five motor organs namely the <clears throat> organs of speech the two hands the two legs and the genitals and also anus so purity has to be <clears throat> uh maintained in all these five motor organs also then we come to the second aspect purity of the body mind and intellect so when the sense organs are pure when the inputs to the all the inputs to the body are through the sense organs so if purity of the sense organs is maintained the purity of the body is maintained and also the mind or manas as it is called which is neither a sen motor organ nor a sense organ but a special type of sense organ the purity of that also has to be maintained by means of having noble thoughts the mind is said to be pure only when noble thoughts comes to come to it no bad thoughts about any any aspect any human being any animal any issue should come to it. so that is purity of the mind and also intellect intellect is what we call as buddhi which is beyond manas there is a very small dividing line between these two but it is specifically mentioned in the upanishads as manasastu para buddhi how do we differentiate between mind and intellect this is a very difficult question to answer but this is well answered by lord krishna in the bhagavad gita by giving a metaphorical example he says atmanam pratinam vidhi shariram pratham eva tu buddhim tu sarathim vidhi manah pragraham eva cha indriya anihaya nahuru vishayam steshu gocharane atmendriya mano yuktam bhokte tyahur manishinah what is the atman what is the manas what is the buddhi all these things are beautifully explained in this metaphorical statement where he says and this body also where he says atmanam prathinam vidhi so if a chariot is progressing the head of the chariot who sits in the main seat in the chariot is the atman or the individual soul that exists within body shariram ratham eva to this body is the ratha of the chariot 
and if the chariot has to be driven forward, there has to be a driver or a sarathi. Buddhim to sarathim vidhi. And then, what does the charioteer do? He actually controls the horses which draw the chariot forward. So, manaf pragraha me, which are, how does he control, control it? The charioteer, namely the buddhi, controls the five horses, namely the sense organs, by means of a rope. So, buddhim to saratim vidhi. Manas pragraha me vacha. So, manas or the mind is the rope with which the buddhi or the charioteer controls the five sense organs. Indriyani hayana huhu. So, five horses are draw, drawing forward this chariot. And it has to be in, in an ideal situation, the horses have to be controlled by the intellect, namely the mind, which is in the place of the chariot here, which is in the, uh, the buddhi, which is the intellect, through the mind or the <coughs> rope, which actually holds back the horses and then the chariot here has to guide the horses to proceed in the right path. So purity of the body, mind and intellect. Buddhehe manasas katha. Dehasya buddhehe manasa. Then dravya desha kriya nancha shuddhi. Purity of the objects used. This is very important and after the advent of COVID-19 it has become ever ever more important. In a way it is once again the same tradition that we all used to follow until our younger days has come back now. So they used to, in India still the system prevails. In some pockets of the Sri Vaishnava Divya Deshas where hands are washed, washed again and again. So before we touch <coughs> the vessels that are used for performing of Trivaradhanam or the ritual puja of the Lord, it is mentioned that we should wash our hands twice. And one of my grandfathers used to mention to me the significance of washing the hand twice. Once to do away with any bad things that are there in the hand, that is any impurities. And to him, the second time is to imbibe purity. So to do away with the impurities, you wash your hands, hand once, hands once. And then to imbibe purity or get purity, you do it the second time. And then <clears throat> I have prepared slides for this in another context, which I have not used here. So I did not uh, have the idea that I'll be talking about this in detail, but this is very important. And in the traditional way of life, when vessels used to be used for cooking, before they are cooked, they are actually washed and purified with different <coughs> objects or different entities. For example, if a golden vessel has to be purified, turmeric is used. If a silver has to be purified, lime is used. If what we call as a brass is to be purified, we use tamarind. And if iron, that is steel, not stainless steel, regular steel, which is known as iron, iron vessels are to be used. They are purified with organic cow dung. So similarly for each metal, based on their metallic aspects, based on the principles of Ayurveda, based on the principles of spiritual sciences. This is how the objects used to be purified. So there is a detailed list regarding how different objects are to be purified and for how much, for which, what period of time these objects remain pure. For example, in those days, uh, before the advent of metals in a large way, 
about until about 300 years back all the people used to cook using earthen pots so the purity of an earthen pot though it has to be washed every day and used for cooking it it will be retained only for one month that is from the first day of the new month till the new moon day or the day of amavas so they can be used only for 30 days so on the day of amavas they can be used until the day of amavas or the new moon day and the succeeding day all the pots and pans they have to be discarded and new pots and pans have to be used similarly for if you take rice raw rice it can be used until 2 years similarly for oil for sesame for each of these the time frame during which they their purity is retained is known is prescribed so for each and every object the method of purification the sustaining of the period during which the object remains pure etc is given in great detail in the shri vaishnava works and it is very interesting to know that these shri vaishnavas were <coughs> greatly interested and with great dedication followed these principles to the maximum possible extent then purity of location so this is very important how does a house or a temple remain pure of course one has to sweep the place one has to mop the place apart from that the purity is retained by chanting of vedic mantras which will generate so many desirable very pious vibrations that are conducive for the spiritual upliftment of the person who lives in the house therefore lamps have to be lit there are several treatises in ayurveda that mention how the lamps have to be lit in which directions they have to be kept how much light should come from it what is the oil that is to be used to dye the lamp how the wick is to be prepared so deepa vidhi is one very important aspect as far as ayurveda is concerned because based on the intensity of the light the i functions and the more the light the, the less the capacity of the i to see etc therefore <clears throat> the purity of the location is very important because apart from physically mopping and sweeping the place where it has to be properly lighted it has to have good people staying there it has to be made pious by means of chanting vedic mantras and other literature that is devotional in nature and so many other things then purity of actions so what is the definition of a pure action and what is the definition of an impure action so ramanand acharya very beautifully describes this aspect in the shri bhashyam and he says no action by itself can be branded as pure or impure it is actually based on the intention with which it is done so suppose out of animosity i scold a person it is bad it is an impure action whereas if a father scolds a son and censures him if he does something wrong and asks him to proceed in the righteous path then that is a pure action so it all depends and ramanuja acharya gives a very good example so if i take a knife and pierce it or i take a dagger and stab somebody it's a very bad action it should never be done but at the same time if a person has to do a surgery if a doctor or a surgeon has to perform a surgery then he does the same thing he uses a very sharp knife and makes incisions in the body but he is worshiped as the god himself he say vaidyo narayano hari because 
he is doing it to actually restore health in the person who is being operated upon. Therefore, the purity of actions are very important in the sense all actions should be carried out with the welfare of person or persons involved. And they should also be ultimately in line with the spiritual aspects of life. That is, they should ultimately point towards our <coughs> increasing our devotion towards the Lord. This is how the purity of actions are different. So this all these put together is called Achara. And an Acharya is one person who actually helps the disciple establish himself in all these aspects. This can be explained in further great detail, but I will not go into it. So I think I have given you a brief but comprehensive view about what Achara is all about. And <clears throat> before we proceed to read the text itself, it is very important to note the lineage of the Sri Vaishnava Acharyas. It is very important. It has been mentioned in a very brief manner in the shloka that we just chanted. It says, Lakshmi Natha Samarambham, Natha Yamuna Madhyamam, Asmada Acharya Pariyantam, Vande Guru Paramparam. So, our Prathamacharya, the premier most Acharya, is, and I have to note that the word Acharya is very meaningful to all these people who adorn the lineage of the Sri Vaishnava Acharya tradition. So where did it start? How did it start? It started directly from the Supreme Lord Narayana himself, who is the Rakshmi Natha, or who is the <coughs> spouse of Goddess Lakshmi, who is the master of Goddess Lakshmi, who is the husband of Goddess Lakshmi. There are several relationships between Goddess Lakshmi and Lord Narayana, out of which we say Guru Shishya Bhava is also one of the most important relationships that is primary to this context. So Lakshmi Natha Samaram. So here, this shloka or verse was authored by Kurat Tarvan, who was the first and foremost disciple of Bhagavan Raman Jajan. So he could have said Janardana Samarambham or something like that. But he has said Lakshmi Natha Samarambham. So this lineage starts with Lakshmi Natha or the consort of Lord, uh, Goddess Lakshmi, who is Lord Narayana. And who is the next in line? Goddess Lakshmi herself. So it started from Lord Narayana and then it came to Natha Yamuna Madhyama. In the middle we have Natha Muni and Yamuna Acharya. And Asmada Acharya Parimanta. And it actually ends with Bhagavan Raman Acharya, who was the Acharya of Kuratarvan or Kuresha as he is known in Sanskrit. So then we have after Ramananda Acharya also, we have a Guru Parampara, which uh, it has been very beautifully depicted in this slide which I am sharing here. So on, we say that this is the Guru Parampara Hara or Guru Parampara Malika, which is very, very significant to the topic that we are discussing here today. That is, it started with Lord Sriman Narayana or Ranganatha as it has been depicted here. There is no difference between the two. And you can see Goddess Lakshmi, then from there Vishwaksena, Namalva, then you have Athamuni, you know, Yakunda, Manaka, Dambi, that is, it has been summarized in a very beautiful shloka which says, Asmad Deshikam Asmadi Yaparamacharya Nasheshan Kurun, Sriman Lakshmana Yogi Pungava, Mahapur No Munimyabunam. Ramam Padma Vinochanam Munivaram Natham 
ಷಠದ್ವೇಷಿಣಂ ಸೇನೇಶಂ ಶ್ರಿಯಂ ಇಂದಿರಾ ಸಹಚರಂ ನಾರಾಯಣ ಸಂಶ್ರಯೇ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಟ್ರೀಮ್ಲಿ ಬ್ಯೂಟಿಫುಲ್ ಶ್ಲೋಕ್ ಆರ್ ವರ್ಸ್ ವಿಚ್ ಸಮರೈಸಸ್ ದಿ ಗುರು ಪರಂಪರ ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟಿಂಗ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ರಾಮಾಂಜಾಚಾರ್ಯ ಟು ದಿ ಸುಪ್ರೀಂ ಲಾಲ್ ನಾರಾಯಣ so in this context it is very important to note that there are two types of mentioning the guru parampara one is called the arohana krama or the ascending order and the other one is called as the avarohana krama or the descending order so we start from our acharya and go all the way to the supreme lord narayana which is the arohana krama or the ascending order whereas the other order is we start from lord narayana and come to our acharya which is the descending order of the avarohana and both of these are very beautifully mentioned when it is said asmat guru samarambham yati shekhara madhyamam lakshmi vallabha paryantam vande guru parampara so when you say lakshmi nath samarambham nathayam na madhyamam that is the avarohana krama of the descending order where we start from lakshmi natha or lord narayan and come all the way to avaro nacharya and the arohana krama is asmat guru samarambha it starts from avaro nacharya and goes all the way to the supreme lord so both these traditions are in vogue some people say that there is a clash between these two traditions i just want to <coughs> mention this incidentally but it is not so some people say only the avarohana krama or the descending order is correct the ascending order or the arohana krama is not so important some people say no no we have to adhere to the descending order ascending order only and not the descending order but the verdict if at all a person says there is a clash between the two is very beautifully given by our purvacharyas who have actually specifically specified when the ascending order has to be uh, mentioned or chanted and when the descending order has to be chanted so suppose we go to a temple at divya desha where we have the darshana or vision of the lord supreme lord narayan in whatever form he is he might be shrinivasa he might be ranganatha he might be parthasarathi or he might be trinarayan or whichever form actually a person has to approach the supreme lord narayan through his acharya so when we go to a temple or a divya desha in that place we have to actually do anusandhana or we have to chant the avarohana krama so we start with avaracharya and end with the supreme lord and then they have his darshan whereas when we are learning from our acharya at that time we deem the acharya avarohana acharya as the representative of the supreme lord therefore we chant the avarohana krama which starts from the supreme lord and ends with our acharya so this is how the apparent debate apparent contradiction between the arohana krama and avarohana krama is resolved so here you see in this shloka which is in the arohana krama it says asmaddeshikam asmadiya paramacharya nasheshan guru so there is when the samashrayanam is given by the acharya to the shishya the guru parampara is start all of first of all when the mantras are chanted so we have what we call as the vakya guru parampara and then the shloka guru parampara that is the guru parampara which is in the form of prose which says asmat guru bhyo namaha asmat parama guru bhyo namaha asmat sarva guru bhyo namaha shrimate ramanujaya namaha <coughs> like this it goes on shrimate ramanujaya namaha 
ಶ್ರೀಮತೆ ಮಹಾಪೂರ್ಣಾಯ ನಮಃ ಶ್ರೀಮದ್ ಜ್ಞಾಮುನ ಮುನೇ ನಮಃ ಶ್ರೀಮನ್ ನಾಥ ಮುನೇ ನಮಃ ಎಟ್ಸೆಟ್ರಾ ಎಟ್ಸೆಟ್ರಾ ಆಲ್ ದ ವೇ ಟು ದಿ ಸುಪ್ರೀಂ ಕೋರ್ಟ್ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ನೋನ್ ಆಸ್ ದಿ ವಾಕ್ಯ ಗುರು ಪರಂಪರ ಅಂಡ್ ದೆನ್ ದಿಸ್ ಶ್ಲೋಕ ವಿಚ್ ಇಸ್ ನೋನ್ ಆಸ್ ದಿ ಶ್ಲೋಕ ಗುರು ಪರಂಪರ ಆರ್ ದಿ ಗುರು ಪರಂಪರ ವಿಚ್ ಇಸ್ ಇನ್ ದಿ ಫಾರ್ಮ್ ಆಫ್ ಎ ವರ್ಸ್ ಈಸ್ ಟಾಟ್ ಟು ದಿ ಸ್ಪಿರಿಚುಯಲ್ ಆಸ್ಪೈರೆಂಟ್ ಆರ್ ದಿ ಅಸ್ಪೈರಿಂಗ್ ಶ್ರೀ ವೈಷ್ಣವ who is given the pancha samskara and this is done as part of the pancha samskara or samashrama it says asmat deshikam asmadiya paramacharyan asheshan gurun so the same thing which says i bow to all my gurus asmat guru bhyo namaha asmat parama guru bhyo namaha asmat sarva guru bhyo namaha so first we have the acharya then paramacharya is acharya sacharya is known as paramacharya and all those who adorn the lineage and then we also offer our obeisances to all the acharyas asvat sarva guru bhyo then we start with shriman lakshmana yogi pungava mahapurna so lakshmana yogi pungava is ramanuja acharya his acharya is mahapurna who is also known as periyanam bhim tamil then munim yamunam then his acharya was yamuna acharya then his acharya was ramam who is known as uyakunda then padmavilochana or kundari kaksha who is known as madakkal nambi in tamil then you have natham munivaram natham that is natha muni who is also <coughs> many a times mentioned referred to as nada muni and then shathadveshanam swami nammalva and then senesham he was initiated by lord vishwaksena who is the chief commander in chief of lord narayana who serves under lord narayana rather as the commander of the forces of lord narayana and senesham shriyam and then we offer our worship to goddess shri or mahalakshmi and then indira sahacharam narayana samsh and then we offer our obeisances to lord narayana who is inseparably associated with goddess mahalakshmi so shriyam is mentioned separately initially and she is worshiped as an independent acharya and then final acharya is lord narayana who is associated who is always invariably inseparably associated with goddess lakshmi so when you see the right portion of this garland you can see that it starts from of course the picture is not very clear so from there it starts and in the middle you have ramanuja acharya and after ramanuja acharya it continues to manavala mamuni who is the penultimate acharya and from manavala mamuni once again we see that it merges with lord rangnatha himself because it is a well recorded fact in shri vaishnava history in shri vaishnava lore that lord rangnatha himself became the disciple of swami manavala mamuni who has authored the <coughs> commentary on the mumukshupadi which we are going to study so it's a very unique <coughs> guru parampara where in the middle you have ramanuja acharya who is known as the nayaka mani so in the indian tradition when a beautiful uh, garland of many different stones valuable stones like emeralds sapphires diamonds etc is worn in the middle there will be a big uh, a pendant type of a thing which is known as a nayakamani or which is the main 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 uh, uh, stone or whatever uh, valuable uh, stone that is actually most valuable of the entire among the all uh, all the other uh, uh, stones rather <laughs> 
or the Ratnas are as emeralds, diamonds, etc. So Vedanta Deshika very beautifully says, this is nobody other than Ramanjacharya himself. He says, Amuna tapana tishai bhumna yatirajena nibadhana yakashrihi. So in this extremely exalted uh, garland of the Sri Vaishnava lineage, the Nayakamani, the place of the Nayakamani of the most important ornament is taken by Bhagavan Ramanjacharya. <clears throat> and we have several incidents coming in the story of Ramanjacharya, the pastimes of Ramanjacharya, where he also became the Acharya of the Supreme Lord Narayana himself, which we can find in the deviation called Tirupurungudi, down south, almost at the tip of the country that is near Kanyakumari, as it is called. There is a beautiful Divya called Tirukurumbudi. In that place, there is a place where Ramanjacharya was approached by the Lord himself in the form of a young boy. And he said, you please accept me as your disciple. <clears throat> so in a way, we say, that is why in the Sivachana Purnam, Swami Pillaloka Acharya says, Bhagavan Labham Acharya Nale, Acharya Labham Bhagavan Nale. In certain contexts, we say, the Acharya is greater than the Lord himself. In other contexts, we say, the Lord is greater than the Acharya. Both are correct, depending upon the point of view from which we see this. And here you can see three important pictures, which are I don't know whether they are clear enough, which actually summarizes the three mantras of the Moksha Padi or the Rahasya Trayas, which we are going to study. So I'll just come to that. And I would also like to mention about oh, yeah, the brief life history of Pille Loka Acharya and Manavad Mamani, which I will do in the next class. So this is the lineage of the Sri Vaishnava Acharyas. And in this lineage, the main task that a Sri Vaishnava has to do, what is it? If this, this question is raised, he has to constantly chant again and again and again and again until he lives these three mantras. That is the <coughs> Tirumantram, Dvayamantram, and Charamashtruta. So I will give a brief introduction to these three and then conclude today's talk. So the Tirumantra is known as the Mantra Raja or the Ashtakshara Maha Mantra, having eight syllables. And this mantra is the first among the three rahasyas. So among them, this was Tane Shishya Numai Acharya Numai Nenne Tirumantra Tevili Tarudina. So he became both the disciple as well as the Acharya. It is a very famous story that is given in the Srimad Bhagavatam, where the Lord has Narayana, and as he himself has the representation of all the Jivatmas, who is known as Naravatar. Because the Lord specifically mentions in the Bhagavad Gita, Mamai Vamsho Jiva Loke Jiva Bhutas Samatanaha. This Jiva. Jivatma, the individual soul, is nothing but one small speck of mind only. Mamaiva Amshaha, Jiva Doke, Jiva Bhuta. He has become the Jivatma and he is eternal in nature. So the representation of all Jivatmas is known as Nara and he is also equal to the Lord Narayana in some manners, in some ways. 
So in the Badrika Ashrama, or the Badrinath, the Holy Badrinath, which is a, one of the greatest Sri Vaishnava Kshetras or Divya Deshas, the Supreme Lord Narayana gave initiation of the Ashtakshara Mahamantra, that is Om Namo Narayana, to the Nara, which is actually represented in the first picture, that is one third of the picture. So this is known as the Ashtakshara Mahamantra or the Mantra Raja or the King among all the mantras. What is the definition of the word mantra? It will be given later in the work itself, in the text itself, so I will not go into that aspect. Then you have the Mantra Ratna or the Jam among mantras, that is the Dvaya Mantra. And to whom was the instruction or Upadesha given? It was given by Lord Mahanarayana to his own consort goddess Mahalakshmi in Sri Vaikuntha. Shriman Narayana Charanam Sharanam Kapadye Shrimate Narayana. And the Charama Shloka or the final the Shloka or the verse that is the final saying of the Supreme Lord Narayana or Krishna. This is very important. It has to be noted. It was given by Lord Krishna once again to Arjuna who was the Nara only or representative of Nara. But we have it as a historical event where he actually instructed Arjuna into the Karamashtoka by saying Sarvadharman Parityajyam Amekam Sharanam Raja Aham Tva Sarvapapebhya Mokshayishyami Mashuchaha where the ultimate principle of Sri Vaishnavism, that is Prapatya Sharanagati, is extremely beautifully mentioned. So the instruction of the Charamash Loka was given by Lord Krishna in the battlefield to Arjuna. But here it is to be very much importantly noted that this is only one Charamash Loka, two more Charamash Lokas exist which preceded this Tarmashtoka, which is very famous. And what are those? They are not generally known to Sri Vaishnavas also many times. Of course, you people may be knowing. It is the, this is Sarvadharman Parityajya is the Krishna Tarmashtoka. Whereas you have Sri Rama Tarmashtoka, which also specifically focuses on Prapati which was mentioned to Anuman, Supriva and others in the Yuddha Kanda of the Ramayana, in the context of Vibhishana coming and performing Sharanagati or surrender to Lord Ram. So Vibhishana actually denounces his elder brother Ravana because he is pursuing an unrighteous path and he comes to the other <coughs> part of the ocean, the opposite part of the ocean, the banks of the ocean. And he very, very beautifully says, Sarvaloka Sharanya Yaragavaya Mahatmani Nivedayata Mam Shipram Vibhishana Mupasthitam. And he says, I have surrendered unto Rama, who is the person to be surrendered to of all the worlds, in all the worlds. Sarvaloka Sharanya. So Sharanya is a person unto whom one should, one should surrender. So he says, Sarvaloka Sharanya Raghavaya Mahatmani Nivedayatamam Kshipram Vibhishana Mupasthitam. I cannot wait. Sharanagati, we are going to listen to the greatness of Sharanagati in the Mumukshupadi later and also in the Shri Yachanaputra. It has to be instant. So he says, Nivedayatamam Kshipram, immediately you please go and tell Ram that I have come and I have surrendered at his feet. Then there is a long discussion. There is actually a 
meeting where all the senior persons of the army like sugriva anjaneya hanuman lakshmana etc are present and rama consults each of them he consults sugriva he consults lakshmana he consults anjaneya he consults the other chieftains of the monkey army and each of them gave their own opinions and then rama proclaims the charam shloka which says sakradev prapanna yatavasmi tichayachate abhayam sarva bhutebhya dadamye tadvratam mama very beautiful shloka and the entire summary or essence of prapatti is very beautifully captured which actually some of the aspects are not available in the krishna charamashtaka he says sakradeva prapannaya so one need not do surrender or prapatti many times it is sufficient if he does prapatti only for one time so sakradeva sakrat means once on the sakradeva only once it has to be performed it need not be performed again and again and again but that prapatti has to be so deep that one gives the entire gives his entire self unto the lord it's not a very easy task it's, in fact we say that it is easier than bhakti but in many a times when we see the depth with which prapatti is done or is to be done then one feels that it is diffi- more difficult than the argyana from it anyway we will come to that later so lord rama says sakradeva prapanna then what is the main how does how does one identify that a person has done prapatti? so rama very beautifully lord rama explains it he says tavas miti chaya chate so the main symbol to understand a person has done surrender has surrendered to me he says tavas miti chaya chate i belong to you so there is a very beautiful shloka which if you are interested i will explain because many of you belong to shri rangam or the acharya purushas who uh, are based in shri rangam where there is a beautiful 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 uh, instance which is explained by la swami parashara bhatta in the context of lord ranganatha that is the utsava murti or the procession icon so once when swami parashara bhatta the great 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 poet great 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 grammarian great 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 expo- exponent of vishishta advaita and also the son of puresha or puratthama once he went to the temple in shrirangam and had darshan of the abhishek of lord ranganatha that is the procession idol of the utsava murti and after the abhishek was performed there is a small period of time probably a few minutes when the persons who are performing the kainkaryam they actually take a few minutes to remove the wet clothes clothing adorning the icon of the utsava murti after the abhishekam is performed so at that time for a very brief period of a few minutes he saw lord ranganatha in wet clothes then immediately lord uh, swami parashara bhatta composed a beautiful beautiful verse that actually uh, summarizes the mindset of a jeevatma or an individual soul and the paramatma the supreme soul so it is 
Tartam me, aham me, etc. Which I will explain in the next class if you are interested. So most of us, all of us, what do we think? This Atma belongs to me. So I belong to me or I belong to me. That's what we think. Both ways. But the main symbol of surrender is that I say I belong to you. I don't belong to myself. So that is what Lord Rama says. Tavasmi kichaya chati. So now Vibhishana has come here and says, I belong to Rama. Then immediately, Abhayam Sarva Bhute Pyaha Gadami. I don't worry whether it is Vibhishana. I don't worry whether it is Samudra Raja. I don't worry whether it is Ravana himself. So Rama very beautifully says in the Ramayana, in the Valmiki Ramayana, he says, Anayenam Harishreshtha Datta Masya Bhayam Maya Vibhishano Vasukriva Yadivaravana Swayam I have given my Abhaya. <clears throat> so, I have become his guardian hereafter. So bring him. Even if Ravana himself comes, I will actually accept him. And he says, he not only he not he does not mention specifically about Sharanagati. He says, Mitra Bhave Nasampraptam Natyajayam Kathanchana Dosho Yadya Pitasyasyad Satame Tadagarhitam. If a person comes even out of friendship to me, not surrender, he need not come as a person who has surrendered to me. He has to come as a friend. Nothing more than that on equal, on an equal, uh, on equal terms. Mitra bhave na sampraptam nat yajayam kathanjam. I will not leave him. I will not give him up. Even if he has committed thousands of sins. Dosho Because Sata This is how noble persons behave. And this Vibhishana Sharanagati is one of the most, most beautiful episodes of the Ramayana. And Swami Vedanta Deshika has written a beautiful treatise which is known as Abhaya Pradhana Sarana. So it is known as the Abhaya Pradhana Sara in Sanskrit and in, uh, in Manipravada language, in fact. Very beautifully authored. <clears throat> so this is the Ramacharama Shloka which says, Sakradeva Prapannaya Tavasmi Tichaya Chate Abhayam Sarva Bhute Bhyo Adam Yetat Vratam Mama and he declares, this is my Vrata, this is the vow I have undertaken. So I will never give up a person who has surrendered unto me. And what is the symbol of his surrender? He just has to say, I belong to you. I don't belong to me. What does that mean? It is beautifully analyzed, which we will see later. And then you have, this is not known at all to many people. To many people, I am telling. Some people of you might know. Some of you people might know. The Varaha Charamashtota, which is once again, most, most important, most, most essentially to be known, which I will explain in the next class. So you please remind me to mention about the Varaha Charamashtoka. And also, since many of you are very much enamored, it's a right word if I'm telling it. I myself am enamored, of course, of the Srirangam and of, also of Namberuma, where Swami Parashara Bhattar has beautifully summarized the <clears throat> dialogue between a Jeevatma and Paramatma, that is the Supreme Lord and the individual soul, which occurred to flash to his mind when he saw the Lord wearing wet clothes and standing there for a brief period before the Alankara took place. So that I will mention in the next class. 
to please me, remind me about these two very important aspects. So I think we have covered quite a few issues that need to be known before we enter to the text of the Mokshupadi and its commentary. So with these words, I conclude today's presentation or talk. <clears throat> so if there are any live questions or any feedback, they are welcome to do it. Question from uh, the last class actually. Um, listening to it again, you were mentioning something about Namalwar being the greatest devotee of Lord Krishna, and you were mentioning mm -hmm. with respect to the betel nuts and the food, etc., that all of these things were considered Krishna for him. But then you also mentioned, and I just want to make sure I heard properly that you said that Namalwar actually never ate physically. Is that is that what you said, or I didn't hear it properly? Yes, yes, yes. It is, uh, that is how tradition has given it to us. So he actually never ate, he just lived on bhakti to Lord Krishna. He lived in a divine manner, that's all we know. Because when he was actually, when he appeared in this world, so generally what happens is, the child has to cry. So if the child doesn't cry, it is considered to be stillborn as per medical, uh, medical science of medicine. So somehow or the other it has to, be made to cry only, then then only it will start. That's what I remember reading somewhere. That it starts uh, breathing and all those things. All all uh, functions related to uh, bodily life. So it has to cry, but the spiritual interpretation of that is different because uh, there is a lot of uh, authentic information available in our Shastras that every time the child is in the womb of the mother, it actually feels it is in the state of some sort of divinity where it, say, it keeps on thinking that <coughs> uh, it should engage in nothing else other than the worship of the Lord or the meditation or whatever you call it. Devotion unto the Lord, to put it in a very... Uh, briefly. But as soon as it it actually acquires the sambandha or the relationship with the earth, physical earth, it is mentioned that a vayu called shatha influences it. And all the previous uh, uh, thinkings or uh, plans, mental plans that it has gone through will disappear. And one more uh, very important aspect that was mentioned by, by my, my own guru was when a child is born, <coughs> people say that the mother experiences immense pain to actually deliver the baby. So it is called as Prasavedana and it is said to be one of the most difficult uh, pains that a mother endures to give birth to a child, which she does without any hesitation, that's a different thing. But the more important aspect that is not mentioned, it is actually a very secretive thing is, the child also experiences greatest amount of pain, but it does not realize it. And that pain from which it comes from the mother's womb to the earth, makes it forget all those things that it was thinking about earlier. So that is also the effect of Shatavayu, which is actually mentioned in some treatise of Ayurveda, that's what I have heard, that there is some very detrimental effect on the child, on all children for that matter, except normal. And then it is said that when the Shatavayu tried to influence normal, he actually threw it away by means of a hunkara, he actually shooed it away. <clears throat> we do it like that. When suppose a dog or something, hey, or something, we shoo away dogs or cats or something like that. That is how he shooed away the Shatavayu. And therefore he remained untouched by it. Therefore he was known as Shatakopa or Shatari, etc. And then the child did not cry. At the same time, it did not consume of its mother's milk. It did not do anything that ordinary children do. But at the same time, it was alive. 
So what to do with it? It does not sleep, it does not eat. It does not pass urine or stools. Then what to do with that child? But it is alive. <laughs> so then it's a very beautiful story of the Marwan. I think you can read it from authentic sources. Then uh, they said, the parents, they said, we want to do with such a child. And then they went near a tamarind tree in the Alvar Thirinagari, which is there now also, and left it in, in the shade of the tree and came back. So Namadwar grew as normal children would, only for, as far as growth is concerned. And he had all the divine experiences that a divine being would have. So the story is to be narrated in great detail. You can read that online also from an authentic source that is based on the Guru Parampara. So, so this is why the Shatari is, represent, is a representation of Namalwar. Is that correct? No, no. Later, since he represented the divine feet of the Lord, the divine feet was named as Shatari. That is how we have to understand it. Okay. So the conical bound then, that is placed on the head of all the, the Vaishnava devotees in Vishnu temples, it is the representation of the divine feet of the Lord. That was there earlier also, okay. but it was named as Shatari. And in Sri Vaishnava Sampradaya, there is a very beautiful uh, lineage, very beautiful tradition. Because only the divine feet of the Supreme Lord Narayana are known as Shatari. So when you go to the Sanctum Sanctorum of Dambadwar himself, there you have another conical mount which is the, which represents the feet, divine feet of Dambadwar which is known as Ramanujan. So the feet of Dambadwar was named as Ramanujan. They will say Ramanujan Acha they will ask. Did you have Ramanujan on your feet, on your head? And then Ramanja's divine feet are represented as Modaliyan. So in, when you go to Ramanja Acharya Samidhi, they don't ask Shatari Acharya because Shatari, uh, the feet of Ramanja Acharya is known as Modaliyan, who was his closest disciple. So the feet of the Supreme Lord was named as Shatari after the advent of the Lord. And the feet of Shatakopa or Shatakopar was named as Ramanja Acharya. The divine feet of Ramanja Acharya was named as Burli Anta. So in the in Melkote, when the uh, procession of Ramanja Acharya's feet itself take place, they will say Modli Andan yield. So Modli Andan is being taken around. That means the, there is no separate icon for Modli Andan. It is the feet of Ramanja Acharya that is being uh, taken out in the procession. These are all nuances of the Sri Vaishnava philosophy and it's a live uh, tradition which is very much alive and vibrant even in some pockets even. You, you also mentioned last time about the Achiradi Marga that Namalwar, he's the only one who explains yes. the Achiradi Marga the past. Yes. How is he explaining it just from the Upanishads? Or is it that he's no, through he had, meditation? It is, he has it is mentioned he had not read the Upanishads. If I we are for sure, but he had the divine vision of the Archivaradi Marga, and he has that is how it, he has explained it. And among the Alvars also, he is the only person who has explained it. So that is why we say Namadwar is the greatest of all the Alvars. And I have come across several other uh, uh, works of other saints. Nobody has done that. So we can understand the greatness of Namalwar in an objective manner, not, not because we are coming that lineage, but in a very objective manner we can do it, not in a subjective manner, or not that we are enamored of him just because we belong to the tradition. And, and lastly, I just want to ask, you mentioned in this class about the main duty of a Sri Vaishnava is to, after taking some Ashrayanam, to constantly chant these three mantras. Yes. If one, if, is it that one, how does one get that discipline to do that? Um, say, for instance, if you don't walk around with beads or something like that, is it that you just have to constantly Bead, remember uh, to chant? Beads is a concept, is a, 
that was there earlier also for all Sri Vaishnavas. But to chant it, the beads are not required. Only if you have to count, beads are required. So that is why in the Dhinacharya of Manwala Mami, he says, Mantra Ratna Nu Sandhana Santapas Purita Dharam Adartha Tattva Nidhyana Sannadha Pulatodgamam Always Manwala Mami's lips used to be throbbing like this. So he used to say, So there was a light throb in the lips of Manwala Mamani always. That means always he used to be chanting the Dvaya Mantra. So beads is only to count because in the beginning what happens, you have to count, you have to do thousand eight times or something. It's a good practice, nothing wrong with it. But <clears throat> later if you are, uh, if you are, uh, Inner mind gets accustomed to that. It should become a habit. It should become habitual that even though you are not thinking about it and you are not thinking, thinking about something else also, inside it should continuously chant the brain. But then why do you require beats? But initially having it is good. There is nothing wrong with it. Because in Sri Vaishnava Sampradaya also we said, E kantalakna tulasi nalina akshamala. The external uh, <coughs> uh, symbols of a Sri Vaishnava is they should have Tulasi Mala and Akshamala, Malina Akshamala. It is beads of the lotus and also beads of Tulasi. So they are very helpful in a person who performs meditation on Lord Vishnu by means of their touch, etc. That is another aspect which is uh, to be explained in greater detail. <laughs> okay. So beads is just like a starting point then. Basically. Sorry? So beads is just like a starting point basically then. That you know. Yes, yes. But yes. generally Sri Vaishnavas don't ever you don't see Vaishnavas Sri Vaishnavas walking around with beads or anything. That's the whole thing. So that was all I was just well, beads, like, uh, beads had be, a, beads had be worn here. Yeah. Beads had to be worn on the person. And when Japa is done, they have hold it in the hand and do it. So otherwise they wear it on their person also, there is nothing wrong. And, uh, but actually when you use the bathroom, etc., they should not be there. So at that time you have to remove it and keep it and then once again put it. But there are certain uh, <coughs> rules associated with wearing them always. So generally in the mornings, before food, etc., people wear them. Some people wear them afterwards also, but once again while having food, you should not have them on. There are certain rules and uh, regulations. So you have to remove them and keep it in a safe place. In a, it, should not, it should not be kept on the floor once again. So it should be kept in a, uh, on some pedestal or something like that. So some people wear it until they perform Thiruvaradhanam, etc. And then they remove it. Some people put it throughout the day, but once again while sleeping it should not be put. Because uh, it may get, come in contact with our feet or something like that. Or, as I mentioned, when you are actually using the washroom, it should not be there. So you have to keep it separately. So certain uh, rules are involved in maintaining its purity and sanctity. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Namaskar. Mama, do you have time? Can I ask you one question? Yes, yes. Um, can we say Ashtakshara Mantra always or it should be done in a specific uh, place and uh, time? Sorry? Ashtakshara Mantra. Is there any... So always, always it can be chanted. There is nothing wrong while sleeping, uh, while uh, just uh, sitting or something like that. Okay. Of course, when uh, of, as far as ladies are concerned, when they have their uh, monthly periods, etc., it should not be chanted. Yeah. At that time, only the meaning can be uh, uh, thought about in the in the mind. But the mantra is not physically chanted, either mentally or or uh, in an uh, outward form. But at that time, the meaning of the mantras has to be done. Anusandhana, we call it. Anusandhana of the meaning of the mantras has to be done. That, that can be done. There is nothing wrong in it. And in fact, that is what is to be done. Thank you. 
So I'll conclude with the Mangala Shloka. Lakshmi Nata Samaram Bam Mataya Munamadhyamam Asmadatariya Pariyantam Vande Guru Paramparam